venit la o nouă ediție a emisiunii Ziua se apropie. În minutele care urmează vă prezentăm un interviu realizat de colegii noștri de la Christians for Israel cu Andrew Tucker, fondatorul organizației Think, specializată în drept internațional, care va explica motivul întrunirii de urgență a adunării generale a Națiunilor Unite din septembrie. La 19 iulie, Curtea Internațională de Justiție a publicat avizul consultativ despre așa numitul teritoriu palestinian ocupat, inclusiv Ierusalimul de Est. Acest aviz va fi discutat în zilele următoare la viitoarea reuniune a adunării generale a Națiunilor Unite din această lună. Națiunile vor vota avizul consultativ. Acest lucru ar putea duce la sancțiuni și condamnarea ulterioară a Israelului cu implicații majore pentru creștinii din întreaga lume care sprijină Israelul. Vizionare plăcută! The International Court of Justice recently issued an advisory opinion on the so-called occupied Palestinian territory in Israel. This opinion can have a huge negative and even threatening impact on Israel. We're going to speak about this in this program. Our special guest is Mr. Andrew Tucker, co-founder and director of the The Hague Initiative for International Cooperation. Andrew Tucker, welcome in our program. Thank you, Canadis. Let's start immediately. Can you explain us what does it mean, this advisory opinion? What does it say? Cornelis, this advisory opinion is highly problematic. We have uh, an opinion by the highest judges in the world, the highest in the UN system, who have made um, a document which says that Israel has no rights whatsoever in the core mountainous areas of what is known as Palestine. Israel must withdraw from those territories. They call the occupied Palestinian territory, as it's known in the UN, and all settlers must be evacuated. This uh, advisory opinion is the conclusion, as I see it, of 100 years of the enemies of Israel who do not want to see the Jewish state exist finally achieving their goal of having these judges come with a pronouncement which they will now use in the political sphere to undermine and destroy the state of Israel. I think it's as simple as that. But what is the status of that opinion and why is it so threatening for Israel? Well, um, this is an advisory opinion. The court uh, is a UN body. It has two functions. It can decide on disputes between states. If states bring a dispute to the court, that is not what's happening here. It can give an opinion to a UN organ. In this case, it was the General Assembly that put two questions to the court in 2022. They were biased and selective questions because they were, um, uh, they were written and drafted by um, the Palestinian delegation plus 87 member states who voted for it, less than half of the UN member states. Uh, they've been working towards this for the last decades. Uh, it was 87 states ganging up against one member state to ask the court to look only at the state of Israel's violations of international law. Not one moment has the court looked at Palestinian violations of international law or violations by any other state, just Israel in this case. So the, the microscope is on Israel um, and the court received submissions, written submissions, oral presentations from uh, 52 of these uh, 87 member states, uh, plus a few states who were opposing these proceedings. But highly problematic, we have three international organizations who were also in court. The Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, the League of Arab States and the African Union. They all represent uh, many, many member states, probably about half the number of UN member states, presenting the case effectively saying that the very foundations of the state of Israel are illegitimate. I think it's terribly important to understand this point. This is not about territorial borders. It's not about whether or not the Palestinians can have self-determination. This is about the existence of the Jewish state of Israel. And they were in court saying that everything that lay the foundation 
of the State of Israel 1948, going right back to the First World War, the Balfour Declaration, San Remo, the Mandate for Palestine, all illegitimate because it, uh, it undermines the Palestinians' right. They are the exclusive owners of this land. That is their case, and the court has bought into it. So its opinion, in my view, uh, is very one-sided and selective. Uh, it's important to note only 11 of the 15 judges supported the opinion in its totality. It means that four judges, Sebatindi, the Ugandan, uh, plus three together, Tomka, Abraham and Arescu, um, important judges from European countries, said the court has got it wrong. The court has got it wrong. They're very clear about that, legally and uh, factually. Um, so when you ask what is the effect of the opinion, it is a, it's an advice by the court to the General Assembly. It is not a decision, it's not a determination, it's not a resolution of the conflict. It is simply an opinion on some legal and factual issues and it's up to the General Assembly to determine, decide what it thinks of this opinion. It doesn't have to follow it, it doesn't have to treat it as binding, it can be critical of parts or all of it. Uh, it's up to every UN member state to critically analyse this opinion and not take it at face value. One might think, and also member states might think, that it uh, can have impact that the court was not unanim unanimous. Yeah, absolutely. It's very important. I mean, the court's never or very rarely unanimous, so that's the way this court works. Um, but again, very important to, to so this was not a case, Israel was not a party to the proceedings. And you can be critical of Israel for that, but they had every right not to be participating. The court was getting a one-sided um, set of submissions before it. Remember, many of these judges, they've never been to Palestine. They've never visited the territory. So they don't really know. The maps were not presented. The history was not presented. The security problems were not presented. They were kind of deciding in a vacuum. So all of that has to be taken into account when assessing the uh, authoritative nature of the, of the opinion. And the fact that it is divided uh, is, I think, terribly important. What these four, and there were other judges as well that were critical of parts of the opinion, must be taken uh, very seriously. And I think particularly Judge Sebutindi, the Ugandan, will come back to her arguments in, in a minute. Um, but she was strongly critical of the whole approach to the court. Can you mention one point of her criticism? Look, basically she, she says the court um, has taken a one-sided selective approach to history. That's because that's the narrative presented by the Arab uh, and Islamic countries. And the court should never have allowed itself, it never had the information before it, to make a truly judicial decision. That's her core criticism. But isn't it, uh, Andrew, isn't it in in incredible that the court, such a high level court, just ignores uh, the history, the legal history and the political real, real history in Israel before 67? Uh, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And, and again, the f at least four of the judges said this is unacceptable, um, uh, even if that was not well presented to the court. There were states that did talk about the history before. It's not like the court didn't have information before it. It did, but it chose to ignore it. Um, so that is, that's highly problematic. Does this advisory opinion also totally neglect the Oslo agreements? Because Oslo agreements were international law, and in these agreements was mentioned that every peace solution should be reached by negotiations. A absolutely, Chris. It's not only the Oslo Accords, it's the whole UN sanctioned system ever since, uh, really, since Israel was, was established, it's been agreed and de determined that the only way to reach a compromise for these competing claims and interests is through negotiations and not through one-sided measures. The Palestinians have come here to the court to obtain a one-sided uh, determination in their view. No. International law resolution 242 is a good expression of it. It's a non-binding resolution, but the principles apply that the only way to, um, to reach a compromise of the conflicting interests and rights under different aspects of international law is through a negotiation process. Uh, and the Oslo agreements came out of that, the Madrid 
Conference in 1991 laid the foundation. Uh, and Oslo Accords were signed by the United Nations and many other states. They are binding not only on the PLO in Israel, but on UN member states. And I fully agree the court has undermined and ignored all of this. Uh, and I think this is a fundamental point when we're talking about the opinion. One of the reasons why we shouldn't be adopting it is because it's undermining the possibility of compromise and agreement. There will only be peace in the region when the Palestinians and Israel and the Jewish people are able to live together in harmony. And this is creating conflict rather than, uh, than yeah. resolving it. What do you think will happen when the United Nations General Assembly will speak about this in September? Well, this is where it gets very, very dangerous. Um, again, there are, th there are three problems with this opinion. It's biased, it's dangerous, and it's wrong, right? Um, but when it comes to the General Assembly, it becomes political and states are going to vote whether they think it's good or bad, mm. they're going to vote for it yeah. or, or yeah. against it. And yeah. Many will vote for it because this is their yeah. kind of ideology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the possibility and maybe even the likelihood is that a majority of member states are going to say, we accept this opinion. Yeah. Now, what the court has said is um, not only must Israel remove itself from these territories, the, its military and civilians, other member states are obliged under international law to make sure this happens, and the UN must make sure it happens. So we're talking about sanctions, we're talking about divestment, mm -hmm. we're talking about boycotts of Israel. A state like the Netherlands um, uh, is going to be under enormous pressure to um, remove and cut all ties with Israel. It's not just about the territories. It's not just about support for activities in the territories. What this opinion is now saying, if it's accepted, is that Israel is such a foundational violator of international law that it must be sanctioned until it complies um, with the requirement to unilaterally withdraw itself, which Israel will never, ever do. Uh, what, certainly not after October the 7th. Yeah. What could be the impact when everything will happen, as you say? What could be the, the, the impact for member states, churches, uh, pro-Israel organizations, pro-Israel political parties and all other institutions? What can be the impact? Well, the, the result of this, again, is to say that um, what the opinion is saying is the law requires sanctions to be imposed on Israel until it complies. So you can be pro-Israel, you can take whatever position you want, but this is saying the government, if the government uh, decides it must follow international law and it regards this as being uh, a, 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 a correct uh, evaluation of international law, then the government of the Netherlands or any other state is going to say, well, we have to um, whether the UN decides or not, we have to implement this opinion. So there will be all kinds of groups pressurizing uh, the governments now to unilaterally impose sanctions on Israel, to cut all ties. We're talking about universities, uh, commercial ties, political ties, until Israel complies. This is, this is huge. This is really fundamental and it goes it's a, it's a deep attack on the very existence of the Jewish state of yeah. Israel. So member states should vote against these negative resolutions. Yeah, I, I, I believe so. Um, uh, again, not every word in the opinion is wrong, but the conclusions are definitely wrong. As I said, there's three main problems. It's biased, it's dangerous, and it's wrong historically and uh, legally, and there are a number of arguments that we can look at under each of those heads. Judge Sebatindi, I think, has brilliantly analysed it and, and um, summarised all of those. I can just mention a few of them. But basically, she says this is a gross violation of the sovereignty of a UN member state. Israel, whether you like it or not, came into existence in 1948, didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of the mandate for Palestine, which was the right of the Jewish people 
to a national homeland in Palestine, including Judea and Samaria and Jerusalem. The court is sweeping that aside. That's unacceptable. And the mandate was international law. It was because definitely it international was in law. established by the League of Nations. Absolutely. It's a treaty that was binding under international law, and the court has simply ignored this. It doesn't even refer to the fact that the mandate required the establishment of a Jewish homeland. So this is, a, this is why it's deeply wrong. Uh, it looks at history as if the history of the territory started in 1967. Israel suddenly occupied territory that belonged to the Palestinians. There's no legal analysis of why they think this belongs to the Palestinians. Um, and if their legal analysis is right, then the logic would say, well, all of Israel belongs to the Palestinians. That's why I think this is so dangerous. Um, it ignores... Moreover, the whole context within which this conflict is taking place, um, the role of Iran, the role of Islamic extremist jihad terrorism in the region, the problems of what happened in the Gaza Strip, the fact that Iran and others are deeply embedded in the West Bank, the court doesn't mention any of these things. It was not presented to the court because the process was so biased and selective. So we have a kind of a, um, a statement by the courts which are devoid of reality, really. Uh, if Israel were to withdraw unilaterally from the West Bank, what is going to happen, Cornelis? It will be the same as happened in Gaza in 2005. Hamas will take power, uh, or worse, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the other groups. Iran will have free reign to take control. And this is not going to be a peace-loving state, a democratic state next to Israel. This is going to be a violently aggressive state which is intended to destroy the state of Israel. And the court has taken none of that into account. So, Andrew, we cannot underestimate the effect and the impact of a possible negative resolution by the United Nations no, General Assembly. No, this, 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 is a, this is a really important yeah. moment in history, yeah. Cornelis. Yeah. We are coming up to a moment. The General Assembly has no power, right? It's a political body, has no mm. legislative power. It cannot make binding decisions. Mm. Nevertheless, mm. a resolution along these lines will lead to uh, a whole raft of uh, actions mm. against Israel, this growing anti-Semitism mm. and the growing push to undermine mm. Zionism and the existence of the Jewish right. people. So right. I believe we have a fundamentally important window of opportunity mm. to be talking about this and to understand why this is so fundamentally mm. problematic. Mm. Um, so I really hope that we all under, read into this. Um, you can visit our website. We have materials available so that you can use it in making submissions to your governments or whatever. Um, uh, in order that there is a pushback against, uh, and it's not against the court, I'm, we're not criticising the judges individually, although I think there are some judges who are deeply biased, particularly the president, Lebanese former diplomat, very anti-Israel, he's been very aggressive, uh, he should never have been presiding over these proceedings. Um, but the whole process and the whole UN process, which is deeply biased against Israel, we need to realise this is deeply, deeply flawed. Yeah. What can we do? What can our viewers in their various countries do? Well, the first thing you can do, uh, Cornelius, is first of all be informed. Make sure you understand. Read some of these documents. They're not dry legal documents. I uh, highly recommend uh, certainly the opinion, you'll get a flavour and a sense for how esoteric it, uh, it is and, and rather one-sided. The dissenting opinion of Judge Julia Sebutindi, a brilliant piece of work. It explains the history and the legal principles, I think, in very clear language. Uh, you can download it from the ICJ website. You'll find it on our website. So be informed. We have created materials uh, on the Think website that are freely available. Um, very shortly, we'll have a briefing paper which you can use to send to your members of parliament, to your government. It explains the reasons why uh, states should be very critical of this advisory opinion and what the possibilities are in voting in the UN in September. 
So these are all possible. And I would say engage in a conversation with others for too long. We've allowed ourselves, we've allowed the public discourse to be dominated by one side of the agenda. And uh, Israel has not been good at it, and others have also not been good at it, as putting the true historical and legal narrative. And I encourage everybody to engage in that. Well, Andrew Tucker of the Hague Initiative for International Cooperation, thank you very much for this very informative and important information. And dear viewers, let's pray it's so important to pray for Israel, to pray for the international, uh, for, for the United Nations uh, General Assembly in September. Continue praying, not only today, continue praying until the end of September. It's very important. And spread this information, this video, spread the information also from the website of Think in, on your social media platforms and inform the people. And contact your politicians in your country, contact your governments and give them all these necessary information because what's going to happen in the United Nations General Assembly in September is very important and could be very, very threatening. So let us stand up. Let's come into action. Let us stand with Israel. Thank you. Emisiunea Ziua se apropie, se încheie aici. Vă mulțumim pentru atenție și vă dăm o nouă întâlnire săptămâna viitoare la aceeași oră. Sunt Codruța Burghelea, vă spun la revedere și Dumnezeu să vă binecuvânteze!